Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Add this person in. Uh, my name is Debbie, and I'm from the Career Center from the Healthcare and Science Career Community. And I'm so excited to welcome you to Science for Everyone. Um, we have been working on this event throughout this academic year and are hoping to bring together um, students and a fantastic group of alums to talk about um, succeeding in healthcare and science um, with and bringing all of your different identities to the table and to hopefully uh, encourage you to make connections as well. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sabrina, who's gonna talk a little bit more um, about the Career Center and the Healthcare and Science Career Community. Hi everyone, thanks for introducing us, Debbie. My name is Sabrina. I'm from the Healthcare and Science Career Community. And just to start us off, I wanted to share some of the resources that we have available to you at the Career Center online on our Career Center's website to kind of introduce you for anyone who's unfamiliar with some of the services or resources that we have for you. Um, so to start us off, we have career advising. We are at the moment fully remote in regards to providing career advising to students as well as alumni. Um, there are several mediums to connect with us. You can schedule a virtual or phone appointment through Handshake with any of our career advisors or career ambassadors. We also have Zoom drop-in coaching and email resume reviews where you do not have to schedule an appointment in advance, but have the availability to drop in whenever you're free to check in on any questions or get some feedback on your resumes or cover letters. Um, additionally, in regards to our virtual and phone appointments, just a quick overview of the model within the Career Center, we do have career communities. And these are for students um, to opt into any and all of these career communities, depending on what your career interests might be. And you might fall into maybe one or two or three of these different communities. And you have the option to connect with different advisors who can provide different perspectives, give different insights, on their perspective or respective um, specialties. So with the healthcare and science career community team, we have Betsy Cahill, who is our full-time career advisor, um, who is currently on personal leave. So I am in the moment filling in and doing all of our advising appointments. We have Debbie, again, our employer engagement specialist. This webpage is really cool. It gives a summary of the different industries and career areas within healthcare and science. And if any of these are interesting to you, you can click in, learn more, learn about trends and careers within these fields, um, see some of our career specific resources, student orgs who fall into the healthcare and science career community and additional resources for gaining healthcare and science related experiences. And so again, this is on our website. It will be forwarded to you with a video to this event. Um, so you have access to this in a concise email. And to kind of tie into our healthcare and science career community, we do have an upcoming event. It is our career community pop-up event. We're doing a healthcare thankathon this quarter where we will be writing messages and spreading gratitude to healthcare workers. And we hope you guys can come. Please feel free to bring a friend. Um, we will obviously be sending messages to these healthcare workers. Um, and with time, we'll hopefully be playing a game of virtual telephone. So that could be really fun too. So again, bring a friend, sign up, it's on Handshake. Um, and as an additional resource, we have a career library. This is a cool place that you can download and read and watch helpful videos and handouts and articles related to professional development topics, um, specifically this in-depth library of PDF handouts from tips on resume writing, networking, um, graduate school. So wherever you are in your process, there is definitely something here for you that you can look into and learn about from home. Um, and then if you do have any questions on anything you find here, feel free to send us an email, schedule an appointment. 
Um, and last but not least, as this is a networking focused event that we have with us today, um, I did want to highlight our ASK network. It stands for Alumni Sharing Knowledge. Um, this is a great place for students and alumni from DePaul to connect with one another, learn about each other's experiences during and after DePaul, um, to connect with professionals who have the experience of being a DePaul student. Um, what was their experience like after graduating, for example? Where do they find themselves now? Um, so to kind of tie it in with our event today, um, we have some really cool DePaul alums who will be sharing their career journeys and a lot of their experiences and insights with us. And to help facilitate this conversation, we have our moderator for today, uh, who is currently a student about to graduate from DePaul. Um, Megan, she will quickly introduce herself, give a little bit of insight on her journey at DePaul, and then facilitate the rest of our discussion for today. Um, so I will Hi everyone, on. my name is Megan, as we talked about earlier, and I'm a senior majoring in health sciences, and I'm minoring in biology and bioethics as well. Uh, just a quick introduction to myself. Um, and career goals. I uh, want to be a physician in the future, but uh, currently taking a gap year. So I've been doing the whole uh, applying for jobs, doing going, going to interviews. I have two interviews tomorrow. I had two last week. So uh, I've been using the Career Center a lot, actually, and it's been really helpful. And I'm excited to be asking questions uh, as a student perspective. But uh, getting into the questions, um, First, I would like for, if possible, for um, our panelists to give a quick introduction about themselves, their current role, and any notable past experiences. So what's your current job and how did you get there? Uh, I can start. Um, so my name is Amanda, uh, as it says, so when Official. I originally talked with Debbie, I was still a PhD candidate, but I actually just finished on Friday my PhD. Uh, so I'm really in sort of this transition mode here. Uh, but what I do there, so I focus really, it was at UIC, it's a R1 institution. So it's very heavily focused on research. And I'll get more into this as we dig into the panel. Uh, but I had a lot of research experience when I was at DePaul. Thankfully, um, I was able to make a lot of connections with uh, a lot of the professors that are there because a lot of them do research and uh, they have a lot of connections. So I was able to really take advantage of this, this system. So I'm so happy that ASK and this is uh, now a thing because it wasn't as strong when I was there at DePaul. But anyways, uh, at UIC, I serve as the primary instructor for the genetics lab. Um, so very different from what I research, uh, but I love teaching. Um, so I kind of wanted to make sure I could still do some teaching and also do some research. Uh, so really, that's what I do. I do research and I also teach. Um, and that's sort of where I plan to move in the future as well. I can go next. Um, hi, I'm Celine Sepulveda. I'm the program manager with Larry Children's Hospital. So I'm with their workforce development and multicultural education area. So um, a lot of my work is working with youth, working with high school, college students, get them interested in healthcare careers and give them a lot of support to continue on and come back to for employment. Um, because a big issue with hospitals across the country is uh, underrepresentation. So there's not a lot of diversity in higher roles at physicians, nursing, everything. So our job is to bring diverse communities, bring students from low income areas to really get these opportunities. And yeah, I think my uh, grad school experience at DePaul, like Amanda was saying with those uh, connections at DePaul, it just really helps get me get my foot started and everything and really grow into my position at Lurie. Okay, hello, my name is Marquis Price. I am an occupational therapist. I am a pediatric and school-based OT. So I work with children from little ones, babies, all the way up through, um, eighth grade in my current role. 
So I graduated from DePaul University with my bachelor's degree in psychology in 2017. Um, and then I went to graduate school at Midwestern University to get my clinical doctorate in occupational therapy. It's almost been a year that I've graduated. I graduated last May 20th. <laughs> so I've almost been an occupational therapist for one year. Um, and my experience at DePaul really helped me become, I think the OT that I am because of the Vincentian mission there and the way that it is so community service based has really shaped the type of professional that I've become. Thank you so much everyone for sharing. Um, getting into some other questions. So something that, um, I myself and a lot of other students have experienced, and I'm sure you have as well, where you have your set goal in mind, your career path, and then you hit a stumble or a struggle. And for me, it was organic chemistry, it didn't do too well the first time I took it. So I had to end up retaking it. And I'm just uh, wondering if any of y'all as comfortable as you are sharing with your struggles, how you overcame them. I can start. Um, I also did not like chemistry. I never made it to Orgo because I knew I was not going to be good at that. So even like regular chemistry was hard for me. So I rerouted my career because of that. <laughs> but initially I was thinking physical therapy and I applied to PT schools and everything and then I didn't get in. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? But and that was like senior year. And then I took some public health classes. And then I feel like when one door closes and another one opens kind of thing. So I feel when I was in public health classes, it really made more sense to me. Like I want to work with communities. I want to work with people, address these bigger issues going on in the country. So then I, I heard about uh, DePaul had a public health program for my teacher. So, I mean, that was really helpful. Then I got into that and it worked out. Yeah, I'll piggyback on what Selena just said. I remember, um, like I said, the this college was new when I came to DePaul. So I came to DePaul in 2010. Um, and so the way I majored in environmental science, um, but part of the requirements was to take a lot of those science classes that pre-meds take. Um, and I really did not want to take Orgo. Um, and I fought very hard to get out of taking Orgo because I was telling my advisors it had nothing to do with what I was interested in studying. Um, I never wanted to be a physician. Um, I always liked being outdoors. Uh, I'm an ecologist by trade. Um, and so not saying I did this because I know I did not at all. Uh, but I did make a lot of noise and I, I researched a lot into what was involved um, with the field that I wanted to go to. And they made it a requirement where we no longer had to take Orgo. Um, I think it's like switched to like G GIS or something like that, taking that series. Um, so really knowing how to advocate for yourself, although a lot of students I know, sometimes you have no option, especially for you, Megan, I'm sure. If you want to be a physician, Orgo is something you can't get around um but for sure advocating for yourself and not being afraid to do the research um to see what's involved it's no one route to get to sort of the end destination um that's really what i learned okay so chemistry was admittedly admittedly one of my struggles as well i didn't even make it through gen chem i have two big fat w's on my DePaul transcripts because i withdrew from gen chem in the lab and then switched my major from biology to psychology <laughs> but i don't think that was my biggest obstacle um <laughs> my but i just want to say chemistry is hard um my biggest obstacle though was not quite knowing what I wanted to do. And so I'm like, all right, now I'm a psychology major. What is that? Do I want to be a psychologist? Do I even know what psychologists do? I didn't want to be a psychologist. I didn't end up being one. Um, but I had no idea what career route I did want to take. I just knew what topics interested me. And so I took those type of classes. And I, everyone, <laughs> solidarity for the chem struggles. <laughs> I just knew what type of things I was interested in. And what helped me kind of figure out what I wanted to do was to start working, like at all. So my first job um, at DePaul was at, uh, through the Stay In Center, it was a program called Jumpstart. And so I went to preschools and we would do like 
early language and literacy programs in under-resourced communities. And that definitely stuck with me because I ended up working with children. Fast forward like seven years later. So that's kind of how I just kind of started exploring like what do I even like to do career what or what do I even enjoy doing, not just learning about but also doing. And that was the biggest obstacle that I had to overcome. That's a really good point. Um, I also did jumpstart. Um, I did it through, I know it's through the staying center, but uh, again, I think there's a lot of pressure when you come into college, 17, 18, 19, however old you are, maybe even older if you're uh, not conventional, but a lot of pressure to know what you should do. And you don't really know what you want to do. You're constantly changing, constantly growing. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with exploring things uh, like she just said. And so what I did is I sought out uh, TRIO, the Student Support Services, but I'm sure there are so many other programs out there now, this is one for sure. Um, and they were just presenting all these different options in front of me. And it sounded really fun to play with children all day and go to a preschool and teach. And I knew I liked speaking and being in front of kids. Um, so I did start out with the teaching route uh, through Jumpstart. Um, so kudos to Jumpstart. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing. I think that really puts things in perspective for like myself and hopefully my other peers here uh, that, you know, there's like stuff that you can do different. You don't always have to follow that like straight and narrow path that uh, it can seem like is the only way to get to your goals, but thank you. Um, and kind of along similar lines, um, sorry, one moment. Uh, how did you manage mental health and or work-life balance, uh, getting a degree and then currently in your positions now? I know myself as a senior, I'm still figuring that out. And I'm hoping that my gap year will help me figure it out more before I pursue medical school where I feel like that's, you don't even have time for that kind of stuff. So I think it's something that you can uh, establish and learn at any part of your uh, career journey. I can go first this time since I've been having in last. <laughs> so for me personally, help my mental health during undergrad, during grad school, and currently, like how I manage it is totally different across the board. And so I'm not even sure if I'm doing it right still, so, but I'm still here. I feel okay. <laughs> I'm getting through each day. I feel pretty happy. So I definitely feel like in undergrad, um, I managed my mental health by making sure I was spending time doing things with people I cared about. So even if I was focused on doing homework, I was roommates with my best friend for the first two years. So like we would do homework together or I just personally enjoyed being around people that make me feel good. And that was a very, that very positively affected my mental health in undergrad. Now in grad school is very <laughs> different because I kind of didn't want to be around other people because I had a lot of content to take in that was going to be very important because I was going to have to take a board exam after I was finished with it. So the way that I helped kind of manage my mental health in grad school was by being organized. That was very good. Undergrad, it was like, okay, whatever. Oops, forgot. This is due at midnight. I'll get it done. Grad school, I had well, I'm still a procrastinator no matter what, but it was just much more organized procrastination. And that really helped me not become anxious. A lot of my classmates would get overwhelmed with our grad school deadlines just because it is obviously an elevated level of education. So the expectations are more vast and more grand. So staying organized really helped my mental health, positively impacted my mental health in grad school. Now in my career since I've been an occupational therapist. I feel like the things that help me are not taking my work home with me. A lot of times I have a lot of documentation to complete from the children or the clients that I see. Um, and in my head, I'll wanna get it done. So at the beginning, when I first started, I was taking it home a lot, but even though it wasn't necessarily due, I just kind of wanted to get it done. And now I'm trying to get in the practice of 
if the workday is over and it's not due and it's not urgent, I'll just pick it up tomorrow or finish it up sometime within the week. So that's how I've been kind of trying to take care of myself now. Let's see, I can go next. Um, I feel like through all those six years, I've always had like a couple of jobs. So it's always been uh, balancing work, balancing school, internships, things like that. So um, my like mental health, my balance was always like finding me time because I need a break from people. So I would try to do like either working out or reading or now I have a dog, so I hang out with my dog. Um, so I feel like I picked up running and really working out more at the rain, things like that in undergrad. So I was trying to do that just to release all the stress, all the, yeah, like just as a distraction and things. And then um, reading a lot of like fiction or murder mystery, just getting my head like a, a break from everything going on. So that was always nice too. And then I think it's also important that you find a, a job that makes you happy, that doesn't feel like work. So like a big part of your life is going to be working a lot. So I feel like um, I enjoy my, my team I'm with, like they're my extra family and like working with students and things that's really impactful for me and I really enjoy it. So that also helps, but yeah, um, definitely have to unplug. Like I just turn my computer off after I'm done and like don't have any apps or emails going on because then I'll check it. So really trying to unplug from that too and get a break. Yeah, I'll piggyback on what both of you said. Um, in undergrad, so I was a commuter. I did not stay on campus when I went to DePaul, um, which was kind of a different experience. So I, I wanted to get involved as much as I could and find sort of a community of people that understood the struggles I was going through because no one in my family knew what it was like to go to college and get alone be in science. I they had no idea what I was doing. So I found, uh, like I said, I, I, was, I went to TRIO a lot. Um, and I would just start talking with the advisors and I was a part of their program. And so I got introduced to a couple of um, summer research programs there. One was Cirrus. Um, I don't think it's still around anymore, but basically it was like a summer research program where you're like really emerged and with one of the, I think James Montgomery, uh, who's in the e, e department. I worked under him and I met like four or five other undergrads who were all the same age, sort of all going through the same struggles, all did different programs uh, from pre-med to me in environmental science, uh, all in the sciences though. And um, just meeting other undergrads who were going through the same thing I was going through. Uh, so that's pretty much how I balanced that um, in undergrad. In grad school, I don't know what, it was just like, I got hit with a ton of bricks. It was such a different environment. The self-motivation and discipline that I needed was unmatched. I was not prepared. Uh, so I really didn't figure it out until towards the end. Uh, but like Marquis said, just having some sort of organization for sure, uh, because you come into a program with a small co cohort. So like group of people that you're coming in with, um, probably from, we were all different backgrounds, all different ages, um, but we're all coming in. So again, finding that community, but also being organized uh, because as you, uh, move throughout your life, uh, just more and more things are going to start being incorporated, uh, more struggles that you have to go through, uh, more things that you're concerned and worried about. Uh, so being organized for sure and having some sort of support system. And then also a hobby that, that helps to unplug. I'm not really good at turning my computer or checking my emails off. I'm terrible at that. I'm always constantly checking and I'm always working. Even when Netflix is on in the background, I'm just constantly working. Uh, so that's something I'm trying to balance, uh, learning how to unplug, uh, so yeah. Thank you all for sharing. I really feel like this like sort of, to me, establishes a whole network of things you can have to support yourself, your friends, your hobbies, and having like the skills to um, organize and not put all that anxiety on yourself whenever times get tough, like in midterms and finals and things like that. Um, another question I have, um, how have you seen your backgrounds and identities as uh, women, first generation, women of color, um, interact uh, uh, with your experiences uh, pursuing your careers and your degrees? And what advice could you give to students uh, addressing these challenges? Something that is also really important to me as a woman of color. So uh, this is something that I definitely struggled with. So as an undergrad coming into DePaul, I don't know what the demographics looks like uh, in 
environmental science or even the college itself uh, because I was really in my little environmental science bubble um, when I went to DePaul, but I was one of three black people. I think I was maybe one of five people of color um, and environmental science was a super small program, but I was exposed to a lot, which is great. And it seemed like a safe environment. Um, but I think my identity, it did make me stand out whether I wanted to or not. Um, and so I think because of that, um, because I was pretty vocal as an undergrad, I was, I had an advisor uh, tell me I was very serious and he didn't know that I was joking a lot of the time. Um, but I did use my identity as a way to let people know this is where I'm coming from this is my background this is the way I'm used to things working and if this is different uh I'm curious why uh, is there a way we can change certain things is there a way we can incorporate uh me myself to feel more comfortable in a lot of these spaces um and the same was true in graduate school although UIC is a it's different from uh DePaul because it does pride itself in being um hosting a lot of minority students um so when you are a student of color or a person of color or some barrier breaker in itself um there are usually a lot of programs that are out there uh, and a lot of people that are willing to communicate with you and help with exposure uh, which is really great Um, yes, it's definitely going to be hard. Um, I feel like all my jobs, I've been like the one or maybe your two person of color there and also woman. So, um, and also I do a lot of data for the team. So I feel like I have to make sure I really present well. There's no errors. I feel like someone's going to say something because like, I don't know, it's a woman's presenting data. So um, I'm always very aware of that. And then I've been working at like CPS, UIC, YMCA. So I feel all those entities, even though I'm blurry, um, like I'm very, I stand out, I think. And then um, you're with a lot of people who are white, who are doctors, who are whatever, who like think they have more power than you in, in ways. So it's very hard to always like stand tall and to make sure that you like you earn that spot there and things. So it, it is hard, but I try to yeah like deal with that every day and get over that. Yeah. So just to kind of mirror what the other two panelists have said, I definitely feel like I'm not sure. A lot of people don't even know what occupational therapy is. So I guess I probably should have explained that when I said, hi, I'm Marquis. I'm an occupational therapist. So basically what OT is, is we work with people who have some type of injury diagnosis or condition and aren't able to participate in their daily tasks. And we get them back to doing those daily tasks. So maybe after a stroke, if someone is paralyzed as the OT, I would help them relearn how to brush their teeth or work on different strategies or a different way to do it. In the school setting, for example, if I have a child on my caseload who has ADHD, I might work with them on how to self-advocate for their needs and what they need to do to focus in class. So that's what I do as an OT. Now, that being said, occupational therapy is a predominantly white female populated profession. And so my experiences in OT school um, of my cohort of 50, I was the only African-American person, which was an experience in and of itself, but it definitely prepared me to be an occupational therapist where I'm the only <laughs> employee at the school who is African-American other than custodial staff or um, special ed aides. And so I think that my identity, the way that it has impacted my practice is that I find that the patients and the clients that I work with who are people of co color, or either if they're Hispanic, if they're African-American, if they're, you know, what have you, if they're Asian or any other BIPOC, they'll often make comments or give me the look where I could tell that they feel comfortable with me or I could tell that there is a level of connection that we might have um, that they haven't had in the past. And so that's been super important for me. I think that but that is why it's so important for BIPOC to take up space and not only in education, but to even if you're in a healthcare facility, even if you're there supporting, uh, even if you're volunteering, to be in those spaces because the people that we serve really do notice when 
you can connect with them on a level other than this is what I know about health. I know about science. I know about this, but do you know about my lived experience? Because that's going to change the ways that I might suggest things to people or the ways that I might present things to people. So that's been the biggest way I see my, I guess, my racial identity specifically impacting me in school and as an OT. Thank you so much for sharing that, everyone. I feel more empowered myself, actually. And, uh, you know, uh, being able to connect with people based on identity is something that is really important to me and something I want to be able to do as a provider. So I really appreciate um, these perspectives. Um, moving on uh, to Paul's Vincentian question, what must be done? Uh, what do you believe must be done to work towards addressing inclusion in healthcare and science fields as a whole? Um, one of the things I think should be done or must be done um, is exposure and training because there's this like common saying, you don't know what you don't know. You can't be what you can't see. Um, and a lot of the fields like I know what an OT, OT is now, but in college, I had no idea what an OT, OT was. Um, I, it was so many different healthcare fields that I didn't know about. And back to the idea when we come in as uh, undergraduates, all we know, and there's nothing wrong with this, of course, um, is maybe I could be a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, and we're very limited in the fields that exist. Um, so reaching back as we reach these different levels throughout our careers um, and programs like this sort of sharing these lived experiences and perspectives. Uh, so one of the things I really liked about uh, Jumpstart is we had to have a, a service like for Vincentian Day. Uh, every year we would do something in a different community throughout Chicago. Um, and when I was on Jumpstart, I was also, wasn't just in the classrooms, but I served as, I forget what it's called now, but basically it was, I think the service coordinator where we planned all the volunteer events. And I really liked that idea of going into these different communities and not only us exposing them to the things we do, but me being exposed to what they were doing. Um, so a lot of times I think when we think about exposing someone, uh, we ourselves get exposed to new things. And so I think that exposure training um, piece is really important. Let's see, I can go next. Okay, uh, yeah, I would piggyback on that. I'm thinking I'm biased because that's like my line of work is like exposure and supporting students. So yeah, I think that's definitely important and definitely getting students who don't have these resources, who don't have parents who have already in this line of work and STEM and things like that. So getting students who, who really don't know or don't have access to this. And just uh, like Amanda was saying, just doing the exposure, getting them into a field, just shadowing or at least hands-on learning so they can really see, do I like a, a variety of roles, not just besides a doctor and a nurse and things. And then also supporting them. So once they say, I want to be a speech therapist or something, then okay, now, now you want to be that, let's help you get there. So let's see if you need internships, if you need um, a re letter recommendations, if you need to know how, like how the pathway looks like. So just giving that like, constant support throughout. And even when it gets tough, just having someone to go to to talk to so they can keep achieving their goals in the end. Um, and then also seeing like, like we're doing today, seeing people that, that look like you um, who've made it. And so that, that can hopefully uh, keep the perpetuating all that inspiration and things. So you actually see someone who's been through what you've been through. So I think that helps too. Okay, I'll be quick this time because I feel like I talk for a long time. But maybe I'm just being self-conscious. But so I feel like two things, I feel like a lot of things need to be done. But the two things that I feel like are most important go back to like Amanda, my roots and jumpstart and thinking about how, you know, if there are already gaps in achievement in early childhood, how can we expect like then obviously in higher education, we are going to see disparities if children cannot even learn or are not presented access to the things that they need to learn at the same levels. So I feel like just as a, as a healthcare professional, as a good human being, I always want to make it a point to advocate for equity. And this is just very important, specifically in education, but just in access in general to healthcare. You know, if you don't have health insurance and barely even go to the doctor, 
How will you even know, you know, how will that impact you as a future patient, even if you don't end up becoming a doctor one day? So just equity and access and advocating for a policy and for a community-based support is so important, especially for children, for everyone, but for children especially, we're looking into the future. Um, and then also, I think it's important for people like Selena, Amanda, myself, Debbie, Sabrina, everyone on this call, when you do obtain certain credentials, a certain level of degree, to try to take up space in administrative roles and leadership roles where you have a say in, you know, if I'm on an admissions team in an OT program one day, maybe I can advocate for being more uh, flexible with the lowest GPA that we accept if there are other factors contributing. Things like that, that maybe someone else who doesn't have the same background or the same experiences that I do because of my identities, they might not even think of. So it's important for us to take up space in those roles where we kind of get to delegate or choose who is present or present or create new opportunities um, for us ourselves to be present at. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. I really was really resonating with everything you all were saying. And I really think that, um, I just feel like that is all such good points. Um, moving on to a new question, um, something that is really on my mind lately in the job hunt sense. Uh, networking can be really important, but also really scary to think about. And how have building connections and community helped you in your career? I'll go this time and I'll actually be quick. So I feel like just being nice, being kind, and also showing your skills and your knowledge when it's appropriate, you know, not being a know-it-all, but you have opportunities to elaborate on things that you are passionate about, things that you are educated on, uh, doing that with people, regardless of their title, even if it is the president of whatever, um, being confident and comfortable to put yourself out there, even if it doesn't result to anything right then, they might email you three months later, six months later with an opportunity that you weren't even expecting. So just being kind and showing your strengths and your knowledge when it's appropriate. I agree. Um, I think when we think about networking, we think it's always, let me stand in front of this very important person and sell myself. And it's not always that. Uh, it could be just building a connection and relationship with that person. Uh, it could be the president of that company. It could be your advisor, an undergraduate. It could be your professor in a class. It could be the student sitting next to you. Uh, so networking can be with a number of different people. And I didn't know what networking was, especially in undergrad. Um, and I didn't know how to do it or the classic way that I thought I should have to do it. I would always think I need to have a two minute speech or a 30 second elevator pitch with every person that I met. And that was not the case. Uh, so I think I started networking, not knowing I was networking very early on. Um, again, when I would go into TRIO, the student support services, um, because I was a part of that program, we had to always meet with an advisor and I kind of dreaded it early on. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to like talk about myself and career goals because I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I found myself just saying things because I thought it sounded good. Um, and what ended up happening is she started putting me in contact with uh, other people in uh, the departments. So Liam Henehan and um, the environmental science program at DePaul, she was like, why don't you just reach out to your advisor? Just ask him what he's doing outside of teaching. Uh, simple as that, just getting to know who he is. So I started doing that. Um, and from there is when I started learning about all the other research programs that uh, DePaul offered. And it ended up uh, getting a connection with the undergraduate, the research experience program for undergraduates, the REU program. Um, so I learned about that um, and I was able to start traveling. And when I was able to travel for research just from having a couple conversations. So it was nothing, it was not a one and done. It was a repeated maybe two years of like having and building a connection uh, relationship. 
uh, with different advisors at DePaul. And I ended up meeting um, my PhD advisor through the person, uh, through Liam Heenahan at DePaul. Um, so it, networking isn't a one and done 30 second, I'm gonna sell myself, they're gonna love me or they're not and it's over. It's a repeated sort of building the relationship and you can network with anyone. Uh, you'd be surprised the, the connections you can make from the people that, that you know. Yeah, I would add that networking is huge. I feel I've earned all my jobs because of networking, um, especially trying to get a job at a huge organization. Like Larry Children's, I feel like they only let people in if you know someone or something like that. So you really have to have a good reference or a good recommendation. Like my my boss, she was putting out a position and she knew like, uh, okay, you're going to apply for this and we'll just pull you. So I mean, like, I feel like you definitely need to know people to get jobs and get where you want to be. So um, that's a huge part. And then even with um, like networking with everyone. Remember your professors you had like juniors, a senior year, and then remember them. And then as you like go into your cohorts for grad school and things, remember those people. Cause I feel like I still know my professors from senior year cause I still see them in like, uh, Ch Chicago's not that big. So I feel like I still see everyone. So I still see my, my professors into like evaluation meetings or my cohort, we're still very close knit cause we're all community health workers in the end. So like I work with my my colleagues who are at Northwestern and we help each other with our students. Like, okay, um, her students to do my program, then her program. And then if we need like a health education person, I like got another friend. So I feel like it's very resourceful to have um, networking skills like at every level too. So it's gonna help you and help your, your uh, achieve your goal in the end too. So definitely network with everyone. Thank you so much for those perspectives. Um, and the last question that I myself have for you guys is what's a piece of career advice that you know now that you wish you knew as an undergrad? Um, I wish I would have took more advantage of like, being a student and like learning a lot and doing a lot of internships and volunteering. I got into that more in grad school, but um, I think with undergrad, it's a really good time to really look at uh, what's in your community or what's in the, the field that you're looking for. And even asking professors, like, can I help you with something, a research project or something, just to really start figuring out, getting that hands-on experience of uh, what you want to do. And then maybe you'll find out through that experience, okay, this is definitely what I don't want to do. So trying to get that exposure in early on before you commit to grad school and commit to more money and make sure that you really know which pathway you want to go to. So just taking all those opportunities when you're younger. Um, I wish that I knew, oh, oops, Amanda, were you going <laughs> to, I wish that I knew um, to be more confident along the way uh, because once I've obtained my position, I've been working in it, you know, obviously I've definitely had some hiccups or done things incorrect or had a parent be unhappy with something that I've done or a coworker or what have you. But I feel like as an OT, because I know that I put all my effort and all my heart into what I do, I know that I'm a good occupational therapist. And so I, I wish along the way to getting there that I was more confident in the assets that I do have because I feel like I was very much focused on like oh man is this grade good enough is this piece of writing good enough was this test score good enough what blah, 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 versus looking at like oh wow I'm very passionate about social justice I interact with children like they always love me if we're in a restaurant they the babies are like waving at me so like instead of looking at what my assets and skills were I was always like focused on I got to be better am I good enough am I and so I wish I hadn't done that all, all along the way because now that I'm working in it, it doesn't even like none of that really matters because all that matters is how I feel about how I'm doing. <laughs> uh, both of those are good points. Um, so I, I kind of have two things. One um, is a don't be afraid to not know. It's okay. You won't know all the answers. No one's expecting you to know ans all the answers. Uh, there's need, no need to make it seem like you know all the answers. Um, and then the second part is when you're looking for sort of the next step, whether it's grad school or med school or OT or whatever you're looking for, um, don't feel like they're providing, they're the only ones providing the service to you because you're also providing something to them. Something that I did not do in grad school, uh, I was just so happy to be in a PhD program when I was applying to all these different um, colleges. I, one of the things I didn't really look into was what is the community like? 
Um, what does it, what will this look like? Will I be comfortable here? So whatever that next phase is, you're gonna be spending a lot of time with these people, uh, a lot of time at this job and in this industry, whatever. Uh, so just making sure that not only uh, is this sort of gonna push your career, but is it something that you're comfortable doing? Uh, is the community okay for you? Thank you all so much uh, for um, the answers to those questions. Definitely something to take home and think about. Um, I uh, feel like we could open up our panel to questions from the other my other peers that are here if they have any um, pressing questions. And of course, we can give you time to think about those questions or you can put them in the chat if you don't feel comfortable turning on your microphone. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, uh, your wisdom and, and knowledge and experience. Uh, I, I resonated with a lot. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Hosiana Mayo. I am a, a graduate student at DePaul. Um, I actually am going to be turning in the final version of my capstone in a week from now. So that is both terrifying, but also relieving. We'll, we'll make it right somehow. But um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I guess my question is just, um, you know, uh, for me moving on into the next phase of, of my not academic career, because I don't see myself going to school for a little a little while after this, but not my professional career. Um, I think it's a very unique time too to kind of like reconnect, especially with the pandemic and, and now, um, you know, almost as not an excuse, but an opportunity to, to reach out to maybe folks that you haven't talked to in a while. Um, you know, there's people I've worked with this year that I've never seen. So, you know, I definitely wanna reconnect in person whenever that's safe. So what are some tips, um, I guess, in that reaching out kind of um, process? Um, how can you be both uh, mindful of, of you know, the context that they, uh, whoever you're reaching out to, but also intentional and in, in what you hope to, to achieve um, with that, you know, that piece of networking. Um, I'd, I'd appreciate any feedback. And I'll come off the proverbial stage. Um, I think it's a couple of things you could do. One, you should be direct about what your intentions are. Um, but two, you also, if you're really interested in connecting with them as a person, um, setting up a time to, I don't know, hey, just checking in, how you doing? I've been thinking about you. Uh, this is the direction I'm thinking of going. You were the first person that came to my mind. Um, just wanted to, I know some people don't like the pick your brain. Uh, I don't know if you all are vaccinated. Maybe you can grab coffee or something or tea uh, or have a virtual coffee tea session. Um, but I think one, being direct about what your intentions are, but two, also trying to catch up and making it very clear uh, that, you know, you're interested in what they're doing and you would, you would like to learn from them. Um, so I guess if you're, so I'm thinking if you're reaching out to a peer, the approach might be a little different than if you're reaching out to someone who you might be looking for an opportunity from or like in a higher position or something like that. So I think if you're thinking of reaching out to a peer, presenting it as like, oh, like I was thinking we could collaborate on this or I've been reading about this and had this great idea and I feel like your knowledge would help me like build on that idea or doing it kind of approaching it collaboratively because then I really do feel like a lot of times if you do have an idea about something and there's someone that you're close with who has similar background, like career background or educational background, and you two could start talking about it and it really could turn into like, whoa, this is turning into a really big thing. Um, and so that's how I would suggest that you collaborate or I guess reach out to network with a peer. Now, as far as to reach out networking to someone um, who you might be looking for an opportunity from, I think it's really important to uh, be mindful of their time and kind of approach it in a way. If you have someone's email address, I feel like it'd be really, I feel like it could be very helpful to email them to ask if we could set up a time to talk, to discuss whatever you're looking to discuss. Um, and so I feel like that way you can 
be on their time, then you can have time to prepare because you'll know like if they schedule a time with you, you're gonna have time to prepare what you'd like to talk about. Um, but I also feel like it doesn't hurt when you're looking for jobs to just, if you see a place where you would like to work and a position that you know you would want to work in, I have literally just like called and been like, hello, are you hiring? You know, can I talk to somebody about that? And it might be just as simple as that. They might connect you that way. Yeah, I would add if this is um, like a peer or a professor that's helped you through your journey at DePaul to definitely just say thank you. I think it's a good way to kick off. Like, thank you. I'm graduating. Just want to share an update. Um, I really enjoyed whatever you, you did with them, a good class or something or mentorship. So I think that that's really helpful to just kind of like say that. It could be your intro if you're trying to think of something, what to say. And then you can always like, hit them with, a, I'm looking for a job in this field or any opportunities if you and your colleagues know that, please, like something like that. So I think that can really help them target what they ask and what they can do. Because I imagine if they really want to help you and you're a great student for them, that they'll probably plug their whole network too and share that with you to really help you get, get to your next step. And then that can open doors for you too. So don't be afraid, definitely do it. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Yeah, that's very helpful. I like the kind of reintroducing yourself by thanking them because, you know, ultimately they were a part of your journey. And um, I know now, like a lot of the faculty in my program, um, I will hope to continue, you know, that relationship. And um, yeah, thank you again. Um, I actually thought of another question as the panel was discussing just from my own brain, but um, something that I really got a sense of when uh, we were having our discussion was um, the importance of advocating for yourself and uh, knowing your own value. And uh, it's something that I feel like I'm getting there. And sometimes I still have moments where I feel like I need to be better at it. And I was just curious if like you all have any advice on like getting to that point um, like how you can be better about it and how that kind of looks like in like the workplace environment, because something I, um, am always ca cautious about is like being in an environment where I'm not, I'm gaining as much, uh, experience from them as they are from me and that there is a balance there. It's tough uh, to know your value and advocate for yourself and figure out what your assets are. Um, but I have a friend and she always says the, um, the dark side of your strengths. Um, so maybe we, you realize the, it's very easy for us to recognize all the bad things about us, right? Oh, I get very anxious or, oh, I, I don't think I'm doing well enough or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but those could be a dark side to something that is a really good asset to you. So maybe you're anxious because you have a lot of attention to detail and you're very good at organizing things. Um, maybe, so that's just one example, uh, but knowing how to advocate for yourself, is it's gonna be difficult, it's gonna be hard, um, but it's with practice, you'll perfect it for sure. And you could start off with something small, as simple as, simple as asking a question, uh, gaining clarity, because uh, a lot of times we may, perceive things differently uh, than from a professor or a TA or someone at a job. Obviously, it's very clear, like if you put in an application and get denied, that's very clear. Uh, but if you're having sort of a conversation with someone or uh, looking to build in a field, um, you can start off small when you're trying to advocate for yourself by just asking questions, maybe providing minor suggestions. Uh, but when it comes to recognizing your own assets and strengths, uh, maybe you can make a list of the bad things you think about yourself and really think a little bit deeper in that. Uh, what are some of the strengths that you can gain from that? Um, yeah. Let's see, I'll go. Okay. Um, I think you definitely, it, you definitely have something to bring to the table. I feel it's hard for us to always recognize that. 
um, you need to like uh, look back at where how far you come and what you achieved. Um, I like to regularly like volunteer with tutoring or mentoring. So I feel like when you do that, you talk to someone who's like younger than you, you really realize, oh, wow, I have come a far away. I do know something. I can teach something to someone new. So I think that's big. And then um, you can open the door for so many people already for like you've just completed your degree. You're almost there. So I feel like um, definitely recognizing that. And then you are expert in your, your neighborhood, your culture, wherever you come from. So I feel whatever you you have like your lived experience, that's something you bring to the table as well. That someone you're meeting in med school will not know and you own that. So definitely realize your your story and then that's going to bring a lot to the table. Okay, Megan, so I feel like, um, well, I, I like to help myself kind of recognize my value. I kind of think of like what things are important and invaluable and maybe can't be learned that I do have versus things that I could look that up. If I don't have that memorized, it's okay. I'm not unintelligent. If I don't remember which damage to which part of the brain doesn't like helps what, you know, what matters is how I interact with people, the way that the children that I work with respond to me when they see me in the hallway and they want to run up to me and try to hug me, you know, like that's what matters versus um, if I have knowledge about every aspect of what occupational therapy is supposed to be. And so that kind of helps me balance, you know, if maybe my paperwork is falling behind, but I had a really good session with a kid. It's like, okay, catch up on the evals and the discharge notes and the progress notes. I have a lot of paperwork on my line. If you can't <laughs> tell, because I'm kind of behind. But <laughs> that's not where my value lies. That is, you know, that's kind of like the stuff that the formalities of the job that does it even really matter? Is anyone even going to read the OT report? Maybe not because people don't even really know what OT is. So is that what matters versus, you know, am I able to help someone? Uh, I had a patient one time who had a brain tumor removed and had a newborn baby. And we worked on him learning how to manipulate to move the bottle in his hand to be able to feed his baby. That's like what matters. <laughs> so that kind of helps me put into perspective how valuable I am. Um, I think also remembering if you're being asked to do things that are too much or you're not comfortable doing, because you know maybe if I needed to transfer a patient and I haven't had a lot of experience doing that, I need to advocate for myself and ask, is there an assistant or a nurse or somebody that can come help me transfer this patient? Um, the other day I had, um, a child come in for an evaluation and the mom only spoke Spanish and they forgot to assign an interpreter to me. Um, and so I needed to use the telephone interpreting service, services, but I had never done that before. So I had to make sure I was like, all right, when I get in, I'm gonna come 15 minutes early. Please have someone there ready for me to train me on how to use the headset so that I can be prepared because I know that I'm gonna be a good OT for this boy and his family, um, but I need to have the resources that I need in order to do that. So just kind of like knowing when you're not comfortable doing something, don't just, I could just try to figure it out because I can speak a little bit of Spanish, but I didn't feel comfortable. So that's why I knew I need to advocate for myself. If I don't feel comfortable, I'm gonna ask. Um, and if they don't have the resources, I'm gonna be like, well, this is a problem. We need to figure it out. I'm not just going to do it if it's unethical, especially. I would just add one more thing to um, what Amanda said, that I think it's also important to keep um, kind of a running list, maybe by quarter or by year of all of your accomplishments, too. And that way, when you're in a position where maybe you're talking about getting a job or getting promoted or, or changing jobs or graduate school, then you know, oh, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. Like, these are all the reasons why I'm great and why I'm going to continue to grow in this new position or in this graduate school or in this volunteer program even. Thank you all so much for your perspectives on that question. I really feel very, uh, feel much more comfortable feel like in like my path to advocating for myself and uh, really knowing when um, I can ask for help and knowing like, you know, my, like not to overexert myself, things like that. I really appreciate that.
Yeah, do we have other questions? Other questions? <clears throat> <laughs> 